Hi there, Grade 11s, and welcome to Module 1.3. Uh, these are part of your Term 2 modules for CAT. Right, so this one deals with storage, processing, and memory. Okay, and we're going to be looking at what the difference between memory and storage is. Online storage, backing up, some troubleshooting, and then dealing with processing as well. Okay, so let's quickly talk about the difference between memory and storage. Now we can see here that memory, when we talk about memory, we're talking about RAM, right? We're talking about read-only memory, storage, we're talking about a, a permanent, please remember when we talk about permanency, when it comes to computers, it simply means that we are able to have those files and folders in a location where even when the power switched off, those files and folders still remain there. So if we go back to memory, we see that it holds the data and instructions that a computer is using whilst it is on and working, which by definition then means that it needs power to keep its contents. When I switch my PC off, whatever's in the RAM is wiped clean. Therefore, it's known as being volatile. Storage, on the other hand, holds the data far more permanently. And we have different types of storage. We've got magnetic storage, like your old traditional hard drives, your optical storage with your CDs and DVDs, and your electronic storage as well. The older hard drives are a lot slower because it works mechanically. However, storage keeps the contents even when the PC is switched off. And this is what I mentioned earlier, which now means that this is non volatile okay now i'm mentioning this because this is something that comes up often know at least two characteristics of memory two character characteristics of storage and um, in some instances you might even need to discuss the differences between the two so saying that um, memory needs power to keep its contents on while storage keeps its contents even when the computer is switched off. So one is volatile, one is non-volatile, you know, those type of things. But um, this can come up, this question can come up in a table form, it can come up in a discussion, anything like that. So very important. Then we start dealing with adverts and, you know, sometimes they don't even give us the question like this. Sometimes the question might be based on an advert that we see. And here they identify the memory in each one of these ads. This one's got 12 gigs of DDR4 RAM. This one's got 16 gigs of DDR4 RAM. Now remember where the advert refers to RAM, random access memory, we are talking about memory. Okay. On the other side, here we see an SSD and an HDD. In other words, a hard disk drive and a solid state drive. Now, if I go back, what did we see? Our flash drives and SSDs are electronic storage, examples of electronic storage, and our magnetic storage is our hard drive. But these are still storage devices. Okay. In this case, I've got a 256 gig SSD. Um, and in this case, I've got a one terabyte hard disk drive. So again, all they're trying to show us is that terms such as HDD and SDD um, all refer to storage on the computer. Bearing in mind, an SSD is much faster at transferring data than a traditional hard drive. Okay, and so obviously then a computer with an SSD will perform much faster than the same computer with the same specs having a traditional hard drive. We just mentioned now our hard disk drives or our traditional hard drives. You can see there are my disks. He has an actuator arm and you can see there's one, two, three disks where all our data is stored. So these type of drives are non-volatile, which means it doesn't, once uh, the power is switched off, those files and folders don't disappear. Um, they are magnetic storage devices. The internal hard drives plug into the motherboard. It has moving parts, so this is, this is always spinning, and it needs to be fragmented from time to time. So how does this differ then from our solid state drives? Well, here are a few examples. There's a solid state drive. This is also a solid state drive, but this is an M.2 drive, and then we've got an external one here as well. Also non-volatile. 
this one uses electronic storage, okay, which means it's much faster. It's got no moving part. It uses less power than the traditional hard drive and the internal SSDs plug into the motherboard. Like this one um, fits directly into the motherboard or onto the motherboard. Right, so then what is online storage? Well, this is disk space that's allocated to you on a server on the internet somewhere. This could be in the form of Dropbox, Google Drive, or OneDrive. So when we look at a breakdown of this, you can see this is the server, and each person that is connecting via whichever device, um, they are then allocated a certain amount of space, and they are able to upload, copy, paste, download from um, their particular bit of online storage so we are storing files on a server on the internet now again you can go through the advantages and disadvantages obviously the main thing is that i can access this from anywhere um, granted i need an internet uh, connection but i can access it from anywhere in any device that has an internet connection um, i don't need to worry about the backups i don't need to worry about the security but you just need to bear in mind that you need an internet connection. And if you've got a slow internet connection, then some of the files might not be usable, especially when they are large ones. So again, disadvantages and advantages, we just know two. Then we look at the difference between online storage and cloud computing. So we already said that online storage is where I'm saving files and folders to um, my allocated space on a server somewhere on the internet. Online storage differs from cloud computing in that it only involves storing files online. That's why it's called online storage. So what is cloud computing? Then? Well, cloud computing means that actual programs run on a server on the internet and you access them through your web browser. So am I installing this program on my PC? No, I'm not. It's installed on a server on the internet. I've got to have my browser open to be able to make use of that. Then backing up. So remember backing up is where I'm creating a copy of the data or information and I'm placing it in a different location. Emphasis on the word copy. Okay, why do we do this? Typical question that comes up. We do this in case the original files or folders are lost or damaged. We need to just bear a few things in mind. It must be easy to restore the data from whichever backup media we've chosen. And it should also be quick and easy to make a backup. So some of the popular backup strategies include flash drives, portable hard drives, and online backup services. But with this, we also need to look at the difference quickly and just understand the difference between backing up and archiving. So remember what I said to you, backups is where I am creating a copy or duplicating files in case something goes wrong. And this can be automated with um, third party software. But archiving is where I'm moving those files or folders that are perhaps not accessed as regularly, but I'm keeping them to use them at a later stage. So I'm moving the files from the current location to another one to use at a later stage. Here they tell us, storing files that are not meant to be accessed regularly, but kept as reference, usually onto an external hard drive. Okay. Backups are essential, but archiving is not. Okay. And then when we look at some basic troubleshooting, when it comes to managing backups, you need to just understand that we need specialist backup software because that data needs to be compressed. It needs to be backed up to wherever you're going to be saving it to or uh, creating a copy of it. Um, and you want to also make sure that it only adds the changed files to the backup. We can also have problems when we use CDs and DVDs. I mean, this is something that we've encountered many times. Um, it takes long to do this. You've got a limited storage space, like your CDs only hold 740 megs, your DVD is about 4.7 gigs, and they can also get scratched or damaged. Formatting and reformatting. Well, when we deal with formatting, we're talking about preparing a disk to store data. Most disks are pre-formatted, that's why you can just take your flash drives, plug them in, your external hard drives, plug them in, and you can work with them. But now and then, 
they might need to be reformatted as well. This is an important one, disk scanning. Disk scanning and our friend disk defragmentation are the two that get asked more often than not. So what is disk scanning? Well, first of all, it's a piece of software. This is known as utility software. This utility software does what? It fixes problems on the hard drives, SSDs, and flash drives by running a disk scanner. What does it scan for? Drive errors and bad sectors, and it repairs where it can. Our disk defragmentation, um, this occurs when you have files that are scattered on the disk. Now, this usually results from using your computer quite a bit and more so on your traditional hard drives. So this is a utility that puts the parts of the files back together and it speeds up your computer as well. And there we can see what that looks like. Now, when the disk is filling up and there's too little space, well, we can use our disk cleanup utility and this will delete or clean up any temporary files that are downloaded, deleted files and folders from the recycle bin, temporary files, just cleaning things up, giving us a little bit more space um, if we are running out of space. And then lastly, we look at processing. Now, we have four superheroes here in our processing when it comes to the computer we have the motherboard the cpu the ram and the rom so let's just look at what each one does and we'll go into um, a little more detail on a few of them now all you need to know really with the motherboard it is the largest circuit board within the system unit okay largest circuit board all other components plug into that our CPU, what does that do? Well, it does all the processing, our central processing unit. I mean, that, it's, it's in the name. The speed is measured in gigahertz. And when you read about dual core or quad core, it describes the CPU telling you how many CPUs are on the chip, right? On that one chip. Right. Then we have our RAM, and by now we know what RAM is. It's where the CPU obtains instructions and data that it needs to work on. A program only runs when it's loaded into memory and can only work with the data that's loaded into memory. Very important. And then our ROM, our read-only memory, this holds the programs that control the basic hardware of the computer. You have instructions there, uh, as to what happens when the PC starts up, etc. Okay, so these components are all involved in processing. So let's have a look at them. Our random access memory. We know RAM is volatile, right? We've gone through that at the beginning of this already. The capacity is measured in gigabytes, not megahertz, gigabytes. The capacity, right? So I've got 16 gigs of memory. I've got 32 gigs of RAM. The speed is measured in megahertz or gigahertz um, depending on the make and model then our rom this is a permanent area of storage in other words whatever info is stored here is stored so permanently it contains the instructions to boot up the pc now imagine if those instructions changed every time you switched on your pc right so the idea is it mustn't change it's non-volatile and data in these chips are either unchangeable or they require a special operation to change them. We also have cache memory. Now, this is high-speed RAM that's placed between where? The CPU and the RAM. It can be accessed faster than the RAM, and it's really just used to store program instructions and data. Now, bear in mind, your cache memory has very small capacity, so it's measured usually in kilobits or megabytes. All right. Then we also look at how the computer starts itself up. Now, this is a typical question that comes up from time to time. Um, it, you, you need to know the, the order. You need to know what they are asking of you. So please, when you do get this question, just read it very carefully. So I press the start button. ROM has its instructions. Those instructions go through. It tests the hardware. Um, the CPU continues with that. It looks to find um, a bootable drive. So it goes, it checks, okay, there's a keyboard, there's a mouse, there's a screen, there's all these things. It finds the hard drive, finds the boot sector, finds the operating system, and 
loads it. All right, let's go through that again. So I switch the PC on. I press that button. What then happens? The ROM checks all the hardware. Remember, it's got those instructions in it. Checks the hardware. Tick, tick, tick. Everything is fine. What does it do? It now gives instructions to the CPU. And it, the CPU looks to find the hard drive and the operating system on the hard drive so that it can load the operating system. Right. And that's it for memory processing and storage. Thank you.